ذنبي عظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين In the name of Allah the compassion and the merciful All praise is due to Allah the Almighty And may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon his prophet Muhammad His family, his companions all And his followers until the day of resurrection I greet you with the greeting of peace Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome to this new episode in the series Human Rights, a Muslim Perspective and we are dealing with this very very important issue of the main necessities that Islam came to protect we've already covered the first one which is religion and the need for religion and its protection in order not to step into the area of religion and deprive people of their rights to worship and their rights to fulfill the need for being here on earth because the purpose of creation is to worship Allah alone and not to associate partners with him secondly we are coming to the protection of the self or soul the protection of life which is important that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislated marriage marriage was made something needed in order to continue the presence and reproduction of human beings on earth and obviously this is something that we know people do out of the basic needs and people have always been marrying in order to reproduce their children and their children will have children and so on and so forth so the life cycle is preserved on earth however there are some wrong actions committed by people if they're not following the Sharia in this regard and therefore obviously if marriage is legislated then we can say that divorce is legislated as well and obviously we need when there is any wrongdoing or somehow no comfort and no continuation of life and contract between the two sides of marriage, the man and the women, then we can cut that relationship and end it with divorce. Divorce is not encouraged. However, it would be a solution to some of the problems facing people in the bonds of marriage. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this regard prohibited aggression against any human beings unless we do have due rights in that taking of a life of a person that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited the killing of other human beings prohibited even for anyone to kill himself or to commit suicide he also legislated the giving of blood money in case someone by mistake committed the killing of another person then they would be compensated by blood money or uh, they would be giving an expiation in this regard which is to fast two months consecutively without interruption that would be part of the things that were legislated in order to preserve the life and this gives the sanctity of life in Islam it is important that people always not transgressed against others because we can see that sometimes the lives are taken so easily by people even in today's world where there is a massive killing either by poison or by airstrikes or by any sort of action that you may not see a direct killing by the very traditional means such as knives and swords and so on where you can see the blood on the hands of the criminal but rather you can see this in a more soft way even not being noticed but the end is the same is that you see people 
being subjected to killing and taking their lives. Obviously, Islam came to protect the soul. And therefore, any killer without a due right will be killed. Anyone who commits suicide will face the dwelling in hellfire. Anyone killing another person, obviously, will be faced with severe punishments, starting in this life as well as in the hereafter. So there are four punishments for anyone killing a mu'min, killing a Muslim, a believer. What are they? If they do it on purpose and without any due right, they will be dwelling in Jahannam, in hellfire forever. They will be staying there. وَغَضِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ Allah will have his anger over this person. وَلَعَنَهُ His wrath. And he is cursed by Allah, meaning he is taken from the mercy of Allah. And they will have a great punishment on the Day of Judgment. وَعَدَّ لَهُ عَذَابًا عَظِيمًا This is in the hereafter. And of course, in this life, when presented to the law, then obviously this person will have to pay for this terrible action. So that is the reason why we need to preserve the life of a human being. We need to preserve the lives of people because they came by Allah's choice. They shall not depart this life except by Allah's choice. And it's not in the hands of people to take anyone's life unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded them to do according to his own sharia ah, if they committed something that they deserve. Thirdly, we need to protect our bodies and to care for them fully. That's why it is always encouraged for a Muslim to be strong. As the Prophet ﷺ says, Al-Mu'minu al-Qawi khayrun min al-Mu'min al-Da'if khayrun wa ahabbu ila Allah min al-Mu'min al-Da'if So a strong mu'min, a strong believer is better and more beloved to Allah than a weak believer. Someone who doesn't have the strength because you need strength in all aspects. Strength in your faith, strength in your body, strength in your other affairs where you're always in the position to be self-sufficient, to be independent of others as much as possible. But at the end, we need to care about ourselves and our life and protect them from any sources that may create a danger for them, such as bad health or anything that may cause them to suffer. Obviously, we need to make people not to suffer as much as we can unless it is for due right. When people are in a position to do something, and then they may be subjected to like having some pain because of fighting in the cause of Allah, for example, or even being killed. That is a do right in giving away their lives. However, the most important thing, the basic principle is to preserve the lives of people until Allah decides to take the life of a person when death comes. We need to also stay away from anything that will cause our lives to end. As Allah says, وَلَا تُلْقُوا بِأَيْدِيكُمْ إِلَى التَّهْلُكَةِ وَأَحْسِنُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ You shall not throw yourself into doom, into destruction. That is not the way to deal, but rather you have to be always good to yourself. For Allah loves those who are good and perfect in their conduct. You shall not cause death to yourself through taking the means that will lead you to this, such as, for example, taking alcohol, where a person is using this alcohol on a continuous basis, and then obviously they may kill themselves, or smoking, or anything that is harmful to them, if they do it, then obviously they 
will lead themselves to destruction and they will end their lives and they will be responsible for this action. So the protection of self and the protection of the soul of every human being is important and we need to preserve this in order to enjoy our own rights and give people their own rights because if we base it on this everything will fall in place in the right position. I'll have more on these issues of necessities that Islam came to preserve after this short break. So please, stay with us. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man ittaba'a hudah. Amma ba'd, welcome to the continuation of what we were talking about, the necessities of what Islam came to preserve in order to allow us to enjoy the human rights and to give these human rights to others. And part of that is reason or sound mind, al-aql. Islam came to preserve your mind and to make it sound and you have this faculty of reasoning being preserved and that's why Islam prohibits everything that will cause your mind not to function well or to get this state of reasoning out of your consciousness such as drinking alcohol or intoxicants because if a person commits these wrongdoings obviously they will be in fact committing something wrong and we know in the hadith where a person he was given the choice to commit one of three crimes either to kill a person or to commit zina or adultery or to drink wine well he thought about the least of these three evils and he said the least would be to drink wine so he drank wine when he drank wine he went out of his mind and he killed a person and he committed zina because in the hadith al-khamru ummu al-khaba'ith drinking alcohol consuming alcohol or wine would be the mother of evils as we can see from this particular example so that's why it is a major sin to drink alcohol or to be intoxicated and lose your mind because when you lose your mind you will not be stable and we have seen people who have killed themselves because they drank alcohol and they overdo it as they say and then they drove and therefore they committed a crime either by killing themselves or killing others so again the main purpose is to preserve the mind and keep it sound in fact, if there is no mind and a good reasoning, there is no taklif. There is no punishment based on the understanding that a person is responsible. A person is responsible when he has the ability to think and the ability to understand, the ability to comprehend. And these are the faculties of reasoning, which if not, a person will not be actually held responsible for their own actions such as when someone is not having this full capacity of mind or if the person is psyche in the sense that they will not be able to understand or to control their own behavior so these people will not be responsible for any wrongdoing because they were out of their mind and they were not able to base their actions on a sound judgment and the same thing for anyone who would commit anything that will cause this mind to lose its ability or to lessen its ability we need to protect the mind we need to protect this thinking that was given and it's unique for a human being that's why human rights come from preserving this right for a person that's why we say the Sharia is important in the life of people because it will preserve what is good for them it will keep their mind 
That's why they will not commit crimes. And how many crimes have been committed because of the loss of mind? You can see the fighting that takes place among people who drink and then commit any crazy thing. Although when people say it's okay to drink moderately, to drink only a little, but then we know that in the hadith, ma askara kathiru fa qalilu haram. If any intoxicant will make you out of your mind, then the less amount of it will be prohibited. Why? Because again, you'll get used to it, and many people do not know how to control. And even there will be some bad results. There will be some terrible consequences, even if you drink a little of it. And some people say, subhanallah, that the intoxicants or particularly alcohol or drinking wine may give you some kind of healing to some of the problems. And subhanallah, how could that be when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not make any cure in anything that is prohibited for anything that is a source of sickness, any disease, Allah has provided a good and righteous way to deal with it, but not make the healing and the cure of it in something that is prohibited. This is against what Allah has commanded. Even if this was proven to be true, it may be a test of Allah against these people. Even if this was the case with some studies, as they say, or even from experience, you know that taking this a little bit of alcohol would make you better in dealing with a particular disease because Allah hasn't made that the case. What we need to remember is that protecting the mind is very, very essential in life. And we need to preserve that in order to fulfill our duties and to give our rights and also receive our rights and enjoy them. Let me complete this section of preserving our lives with the protection of the honor of a person the lineage of a person because we need to know who are our parents where we came from who are our children otherwise we would not know who's a relative to us and who's not and if people are left free to practice promiscuity as they say then obviously we will be led astray and then all these honors and lineages will be mixed up and we will not know who's who and who belongs to who and therefore we will not be able to have inheritance we will not be able to know who our relatives are in order to give them their rights because it's important to always connect with your relatives and give them what Allah has asked you to do as part of their kindness and bir this will not happen unless we keep the honor that's why we need to continue the legal marriage within the Sharia. When a man is free from anything that will prevent him from marrying and a woman is free from anything that will prevent her from marrying, then we can let them marry and enjoy life. But even we need to protect among the marriages of close relatives, those that are prohibited for you to marry, such as your sister, your mother, your daughter, your grandmother, your grand sister, your aunt, all of these relatives are prohibited for a male and a female to marry because we need to protect the honor. We don't want to mix the honors. And that's for Allah's wisdom, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He prohibited the marriage of these close relatives. But we can go beyond that into asking, as Islam does, for people to produce, to have children. Because if they have children, they will enjoy. That's part of the zina of this life, part of the ornaments and adornments of life. But again, on the other hand, they would be a good source for the reproduction and continuation of life on earth. And they will be supporting you. And maybe if they're righteous, they will make dua for you. They'll help you. So protecting honor is very important. That's why... To accuse someone of committing zina or fornication is prohibited, absolutely. And anyone committing this will be subject to being flogged with 80 strikes. So 
فَجْلِدُوهُمْ ثَمَانِينَ جَلْدَةً This is the saying of the Qur'an. You need to flog anyone who accuses another one of committing zina when it's not true. Eighty strikes in order to prevent this accusation and the spread of evil within a society. Because we need to protect the honor of a person. A person shall walk in the society with dignity and with great pride in the positive sense of what Allah has given him and has protected him with. That's why one of the ways to protect the honor is to not look into what is not allowed for you to look at, especially for both genders to look at each other. It is prohibited, we know for sure, that a person will look at the opposite gender with interest, with interest in the mind that I know it is a fitna and there will always be something in the minds of men or the minds of women towards the opposite gender, especially if they're attractive and they need to avoid this. That's why women have to dress very respectfully. Men have to dress also respectfully and not in any way that is provocative of women. And at the same time, do not even look because for some reason they may be uncovered by wind, by their change of sitting position, or even when you see Muslim females who are not really doing the right thing in guarding themselves with hijab, or even non-Muslims, where we have this mixture of Muslims and non-Muslims in societies, in today's world. That's why we need to lower our gaze. We need to protect ourselves, not to commit this adultery or fornication. That will be a source of indeed getting into fahisha, which are the major sins of fornication and adultery. May Allah protect us all. And I'll have more to say on this, inshallah, in the coming episodes of our series, Human Rights, a Muslim Perspective. Until then, I leave you with Allah's care and protection. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah, yeah, yeah.